big news guys. We are reopening our Fermenting Foundations course. So it's for sale from today through Sunday night. I'm gonna put Brianna on the spot here. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> and here's Brianna. This is what happens when Brianna doesn't go to the hospital for one day. She was at home yesterday and I was at the hospital. So it's just, we filled this a big cooler with milk. <laughs> anyway, look at all that milk. It's like I'm going away for a weekend every time I go to the hospital. To pack so much stuff. Uh, do you want this? Should I just throw this in the car? Uh, I'll just put some. Okay, oh, Brianna. Brianna. I'm here. What's your favorite I thing? actually exist. What's your favorite thing about fermenting? Why should people be interested in it or learn about it? I have it, more than three reasons, but I think my top three reasons that I think fermenting is amazing is because one, you don't need equipment, you don't need canning jars, you, don't, you just need a vessel and salt. That to me is miraculous. It's a way to preserve food. Um, on a scale that's like survival, you know, you don't have to replace lids and all these things. Um, just need a vessel and salt. That to me is amazing. It's how people preserved food forever before we invented canning. And I just think that's cool. Yeah. Uh, it's super, oh, that's cool. It's uh, really delicious, but at the same time, extremely healthy. And, you know, more and more scientists and researchers are finding out that our gut health really affects our entire health and our brain function and just our complete and total health and so obviously probiotics are super good for you and the incredible thing about fermenting is like the different stages of fermenting actually give you um different probiotics and and i just think that's amazing and then uh what was my third reason oh the food's raw and it's crunchy and it's not mushy. <laughs> That's the other reason I like fermenting is because canning makes your food mushy. And I've never been able to perfect a crispy pickle, but I can, I can make a crispy dilly bean any day of the week. Um, but when I've canned dilly beans, you know, and canning kills all that beneficial goodness too. But when I've canned dilly beans, I've made them mushy. So, or canned pickles, I make them mushy and I'm sure some of y'all have mastered canning, but I haven't mastered canning pickles. So I'm really thankful because with uh, fermenting, gosh, and there's another reason, way less steps, way less steps. You just ferment it. It's really simple. It's so simple. It's incredibly simple, actually. A lot of people don't realize. Once you kind of learn the basics, you can branch out and ferment almost any vegetables. Yeah. So. I actually did not like ferments when we got married. Arthur made them over the years, had the kids eat them. I would never even try them because I had had sauerkraut from the store and thought it was disgusting. And I did not realize that sauerkraut from the store is canned. It's a whole different ball game than homemade ferments. It's just different. Homemade ferments, you can adjust for the crispiness. You can decide how crispy or mushy you want things. You can decide how flavorful, how salty on some level. There's just a lot of control with fermenting, I feel like. And uh, ferments from the store are not the same thing as ferments that you ferment because they've been canned. So basically they're not ferments anymore. We've got a ton of really great feedback on our course. If you're interested in the course, go to the link in the description of this video below this video. And then right now I'm gonna actually jump to some footage of my sister Anna. While she was here the other day watching the kids, she filmed a little sequence on some really unique sauerkraut that she made. And um, so we're just gonna jump to that. What are you guys doing? Flooding waddles. Mm -hmm. This has been going on for quite a long time. So much fun being had. Bobby, come down here. A giant one is about to. What's happening? Okay. Sit. Wow. Right? And hey everybody, Anna here, Art's sister. I'm up here with the kids. Art and Bree are actually taking a break right now. They left the house, just the two of them, and they're not going to the hospital. They're just going to take a break. So, woohoo! All about that. 
and we're having some fun here and I'm gonna do a little project. Making some, guess what? Guess what? Sauerkraut. Um, we wanted to, I wanted to answer a question that we got a lot last year, uh, which you'll be about to see what that was about. It's going? Can I show everybody the cameraman? Yeah. Brought to you today by our very special cameraman here. Woohoo! And how about, how about when I've got it all chopped and all the stuff in here, you guys help me mash it up? Did you know it did that? It's filming? Perfect! I'm gonna keep a couple of these leaves, well, not whole, obviously, but like, kinda intact to go on top and hold the sauerkraut down. And I'm just gonna chop for a while, so. Another question we got during the course, which we kind of answered for the people who are curious about it, but um, I'm gonna talk about that here while I chop, is how finely, when making sauerkraut, how finely should I chop my cabbage and when doing other veggie ferments, how finely, what's, how small pieces, big pieces, chunks, and it really depends. So if you do a real fine chop like this, like spaghetti kind of size, um, it's going to ferment pretty fast. What you do, one of the things you do when you chop vegetables is you break open the cell walls and release the sugars that are in there, the carbohydrates, and the bugs that make your ferment a ferment eat those carbohydrates. So if you only, if you took like these chunks of cabbage and threw them in with salt in a brine to ferment, they would much more slowly because there's much less sugar readily available. It's gonna be more work to get in there and get the sugar. Then if it's all whoosh, tiny chopped up like this. So there's that. So that can play into what the temperature you have available to set your ferments in as they ferment is. If you have a really warm temperature, you might wanna kinda of balance that out by chopping your veggies more coarsely, because warm temperatures can also cause your ferment to ferment quickly. And then if you have really, 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 um, only a place that's really, really cold, you know, it's either, what, in the, the room with your wood stove or out in the unheated shed, something, something like that, if that's really your options, and you, you're choosing the one that's cooler, and it's gonna be a slower ferment, you could go real fine and it'll still, uh, the temperature will slow it down. And then besi besides that, and this is really the main answer, <laughs> personal preference. How do you like your finished product to end up? I like it and I am pretty sure Art and Brie both enjoy a very finely chopped, like, um, finely chopped sauerkraut and they'll definitely eat some of this. I'll probably leave this here for them. Push them all together. That is so cool. Now for, uh, we got all our cabbage, beautifully chopped. The kids are already snacking on it. And the unique ingredient in this sauerkraut is apples. Sour apples specifically. So this is kind of a thing people ask about a lot is what about using fruit in my ferment? And I've never, Art and I both, had never done fruity ferments. So we kind of said give it a try and let us know last year with our students who asked about that. But I thought this year I'd give it a go before the course started so that I could have some wisdom to share with whoever does end up taking it. So I'm gonna grate these up and put them in and then some black peppercorn, some cloves, and maybe some of this black smoked cardamom, because that sounds good too. It's different than a green cardamom, 
they're like bigger pods and it smells like so smoky. It smells like Lapsang lap Souchong tea. Have you ever had that? No. It says tea and it's smoked. <laughs> and it's really good. You sure you don't want to try it? Just don't get a whole clove and eat it. This is good too. <laughs> And Jess is like, I, I was gonna help, I was gonna help you, I but didn't. instead, I'll help you. Eat it. <laughs> Just don't put a whole clove in your mouth. You will regret it. Your whole mouth will go numb. Have you ever done that? Okay. This one. That's apple. Well, is it? Cloves are it brown. Cool? They look like a, like a torch. Like a mini, tiny, like Lego-sized person torch. Mm -hmm. Wow, we could have maybe used a smaller jar. I forgot I have a clove. I have a clove in my mouth. You better spit it out and take it out and then eat. Can I have five? Yeah. Where's the clove? Just gonna pack it down really good, try to get all the air bubbles out. And then we will put a lid on it, just a regular lid, and we line it with parchment paper because that's an easy way to keep it from corroding with all the salt and uh, I will put one of these leaves on top to kind of hold it down under the level of the water and a cup to push it down to. All right, that's it here. Uh, got a date on here, it's all set. I think that took about 40, maybe 45 minutes even with the kids helping, if you know what I mean. I'm gonna go find a place to hide this in the house because I will be back one week from today and we'll see how it is. Just in case it spills over, which it won't because there's so much space, but just in case. I think that'll do. I hope you enjoyed that little clip with Anna. Um, and thanks for considering. Check out the link in the description to check out our fermenting course. It's just available for sale from now through Sunday night this week. Every day is the same for me. I don't know what day it is ever. Um, You're headed out. I'm headed to go talk to our pediatrician, our, it's actually our family doctor, and uh, she feels really good about taking the twins on in her practice, but I just have some questions for her before we, uh, before we decide to use her as our pediatrician because even when our babies come home, they're still gonna need some things. They, they're gonna have specialist appointments, they're probably gonna have OT and speech therapy and different things for a while, and they need, you know, they can also get sick a lot easier, so we actually, have to stay pretty much quarantined for the winter. Um, or just, we just have to be super careful because if they get RSV, it could actually kill them. They could end up back in the hospital. Um, so there's just a lot more to worry about. Mm -hmm. uh, anyways, All right, guys, I'm off have to a great do that. Day. I actually love our doctor though. I love her. I love her. So I'm excited. I'm hoping she can, I'm really hoping she can be the twins care provider because I trust her, I like her. So let's hope it goes well. All right guys, thanks for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow.